Um, hello, everyone. I want to welcome you. Oh, where is it? Go. Turn off the waiting room and it can all come in. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. I want to welcome you to this session today. I am the director of the Academic Research Institute in Iraq, which is a nonprofit NGO that works to foster and facilitate research in and on Iraq. Um, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's session. And, uh, in tribute to the work and legacy of Dr. Lamia Al-Ghulani. Um, our first presenter today is going to be Dr. McGuire Gibson, who I believe um, doesn't have a PowerPoint, but I'm very excited to listen to him speak. Dr. Gibson? Oh, okay, are we running ahead of schedule? Okay. No, no, we're gonna get, yep, yeah, we're gonna get ahead just in case we have questions. Okay, very good. Um, I first met Lamia Gailani in 1964, my first day at the Iraq Museum, uh, my first uh, trip to the country. Uh, she was uh, over in the new museum, which was not yet open. She was in the office of the new museum. The displays were still in the old museum across the river, in the east side of the river, which had been the building that had been founded by Gautou Bell. Uh, she was there with Selma El Radi, and she introduced uh, Lemia had come back from Cambridge with a BA a couple of years earlier, Selma had just come back with a BA from Cambridge, and they were both involved in planning to set up the displays in the new museum, uh, which is, was to open a couple of years later. And they were working very closely with uh, Hans Nissen, a German uh, archaeologist. And uh, at that time, they were, uh, Lemia was very, very insistent that they should get the labels right in both English and Arabic. And she was, she, was, she always was uh, a bugbear about labels. And in fact, the last uh, thing she was working on when she died in, 19, in 2019 was a conference in Amman where they were to train Iraqi curators and Iraqi staff in how to work, how to do labels. So it's typical that you know, th this, is, this is what she was doing at the very end. Uh, Lemia was a member of the Gailani family, which is a very, very special family in Baghdad because it has extraordinary prestige and has a hint of the holy uh, about it. Uh, her ancestor is Abdul Qadir Gailani, who is buried in the Gailani Shrine in Baghdad. She's a member of that uh, organization. And it was from Lamia that I became very aware of how a walk works. This is a pious foundation or sometimes a private foundation for the uh, welfare of a group of people, usually a family or an institution, uh, which is... Uh, has a board and is taking care and, and is run for the good of the institution or the family. And I became very aware that this is what we also see when we read Babylonian and, and Sumerian texts that this already exists in ancient times. Uh, when uh, we were working on the Inanna Temple, it was you know it was clear to me that we we're dealing with something like this. Uh, Lemia was a really special person, and uh, I didn't know her as well through the years as I did Selma. But our lives would intersect at specific times. Usually when I was in Baghdad to do digging and she was back visiting, working with the museum, doing that sort of thing. Uh, she had a, a relatively low voice and she had a ready laugh. She was very funny. Uh, she had a, a bunch of phrases she used to, uh, used to say. One was, can you imagine? And it would be something which, she, which would be very funny and she, she would find very uh, hilarious. Uh, I visited her house uh, a couple of times, and once, the first time I was there, I saw this big gray Persian cat, and it walked across the room, and it, it, she, she called it Sargon, after the king Sargon. I don't know whether it was the Sargon, the Akkadian king, or Sargon, the Assyrian king, but she called it Sargon. And it walked across the room, and it, 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 you got the idea that the cat thought that every time it put a paw down, that the world would shake. It was an extraordinary ponderous cat. Uh, at that time, Lemmy was married to her first husband, who was a cousin, and she had two daughters by him. One of them, Noura, uh, is now a curator of Islamic uh, of the Islamic section of the Glasgow Museum. Uh, I met Noura for the first time in Rome in the seven in the eighties, I think it was seventies or eighties. And where I happened to drop in, I was working in Iraq, I stopped in to Rome because I knew that Selma and her sister Nuha would be there. Nuha was in Rome preparing a, uh, a wall sculpture for one of the buildings in Baghdad. And 
as part of that trip, we went to the baths of Caracalla to watch the, uh, uh, a, and to hear a, uh, a Tosca. That's one of the things I remember about being there with, with Nuha and with, with uh, Lamia and her daughter. Uh, she uh, was, a, because of her status in that family, she was able to do things that other women couldn't do at the time in the 60s and 70s. She was the one, I think she was the first Iraqi woman archeologist to go to, uh, to a foreign expedition and work as an official government representative. She was with the uh, British in the north of Iraq. At the same time, or shortly after, Selma Radi was with us at Nippur and Abu Salabik. And there was another woman uh, whose name I don't remember who was with the Germans at Uruk. And this was a very, very special thing and because because Lemia was able to do it, they were able to do it. Uh, they, you know, they also, uh, there was a lot of encouragement of women in archeology span at the time and in cuneiform studies. Uh, the, uh, where are we going? Uh, Lemia went back to the UK in the seventies. And she went there and she, she met her husband, her second husband, uh, Mr. Wurr, George Wurr. And while she was there, while she was there, she got a PhD from the University College London with Barbara Parker, working on cylinder seals. And cylinder seals were a special thing for her. She worked on seals the rest of her life. She was uh, working on seals in uh, New York when she, uh, shortly before her death, she wrote several articles on it. And in fact, she made it possible for us to publish some of the, at least something about the seals from the queen's tombs because she had done an article uh, where there were drawings and a few photographs and she had done an article which made it possible for us to use her material to put into the uh, queen's tombs volume which was done by Mazahim Hussein, uh, which I edited along with Mark Otuia. Uh, Lemmy and I would see each other occasionally at meetings or usually in Baghdad where she was doing things in 1991, uh, after the first of the American wars with Iraq, I went into Baghdad uh, with Selma and we, uh, well actually I went in there, I wasn't with Selma, I got to the museum and found Selma and Lamia already there and the, shortly after the, the end of the war and they were working on uh, trying to put together the uh, catalog of objects which had been lost, stolen, from the Iraq Regional Museums at that time in 91. And uh, this was quite a job. What was happening was they, they were working on the computers which would crash every five minutes or so. And so they had to save continually. There were so many bugs in the computer system, but they put together a list of about 4,500 items that had been in the nine regional museums that were looted at that time in 91. And Lemia kept going back all through the 90s uh, trying to help the museum. And uh, I think you'll be hearing more about what she did uh, with the museum from uh, the point of view of uh, uh, the Iraqis from Abu Amir in the next presentation. But uh, you know, I saw her at work and how she would work with the museum people trying to put things together, make sure that things were not, you know, were, were recorded and as much as possible with a lot of difficulty. Uh, she, uh, also would keep going back all through the 90s to the museum and, and she, during the embargo, she would go in with, with uh, very, very important things like photographic uh, uh, films and, and chemicals because they weren't uh, able to get them uh, for the museum. She would also take in conservation supplies and she would try to help as much as possible. One of the great things she did, she not only helped out in these material ways and going in and actually helping in the museum and helping people to do, uh, to, to try to keep a standard of work in very difficult situations when the museum staff was being let go in down to a skeleton staff at that time during the embargo. She also had founded in London, a little press called Nabu, in which she would take Iraqi work, archeological work, translated into English and get it out to a wider public. And that was part of the inspiration that we had, uh, Mark el -Tuil and I had, in taking Iraqi archeological uh, work, which had mostly had already appeared in Arabic, but sometimes not, 
uh, in things like the journal Sumer. And we translated, Mark translated into uh, English and I re-edited and formatted and we got it, we got it out. Uh, and we got them into uh, international journals so that Iraqi archeological work is better known outside through uh, by people who don't read Arabic. Uh, and otherwise they would be, they wouldn't know that this stuff existed or would hardly know. Uh, <clears throat> she was responsible for encouraging the Iraqis to present material and she would turn, uh, she, she would then put it out. She also did a, a, uh, a catalog not, or an index, an index of, of material in Sumer, which was published as supplements to Sumer. She was extraordinarily valuable in keeping those ties with Iraq, even while she was, she was in London. <clears throat> uh, in 2003, uh, once again, I went into Iraq shortly after the war had stopped, about a month after, and I was with Selma Radi at this time. We got there, and of course, uh, Lemia was already there. And Lemia, Lemia had an extraordinarily important role in, at that time because she acted as a buffer between the uh, American occupying forces and the museum. And uh, there would have been much less cooperation. It would have been much, much harder to figure out what had happened in the museum, the looting of the museum had Lemia not been there to, to, to act as the go-between. And she, she was extraordinarily valuable in what she did. Uh, and again, all through the time when the museum was taken off display, you know, the, the material was put in the vaults or it was taken and put in, in bank vaults, she would go back and she would make sure that things were still okay. And, the, and, and as the material was brought out of the vaults, she would work with the Iraqis to put it back on display. Uh, and, uh, and again, in the new museum display, which I saw a couple of years ago, which is magnificent, uh, she was still very worried about the labels and she was making sure that the labels were up to some kind of standard. And she, uh, th this is what she worked on with the Iraqis. And I think you'll hear a lot more about that from uh, Abu Mir. Uh, she was recognized for her work as a, uh, as a major figure in Iraqi archeology span by receiving the Gertrude Bell Medal. She's the only about the fifth person ever to receive it. And she was a lifetime, she was a lifetime fixture with the, uh, with, with people from the uh, <coughs> from Iraqi archeology span as, as I think I've said. Okay. Uh, she was honored at her death and you'll be hearing about that from uh, Abdul Mir. Uh, and uh, you know, she is, missed by everyone who ever knew her. I'm about, I'm running way short, I'm afraid. It's only 9.13 as I see, and, I, and I, so we can have, if people have questions or if they have uh, any comments on what I've said, I welcome it. Okay? Thank you, Mac. I, I always love listening to you. Um, it's very informative. Yes. 10 minutes before I started. Oh. You're fine. I wanted to make sure that people had time for questions. And You've gone I, don't, I don't see um, the Q&A function on here, but if anyone has any questions, they can send them to me in the chat and um, or we can have you unmute yourself and you can ask yourself. That's fine as well. Um, but if there isn't any, we'll go ahead and um, move forward. Um, Are okay. we supposed to schedule or not? I'm not actually sure about that. Um, They're usually very sticky. They want to keep the schedule because people come in from other things they're watching. It's, it's, if you have a, if we can pad it a little bit, it would probably be good. Can I ask a question, Mac, if we have a few extra minutes, Amanda? Sure. Mac, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about those first excavation years. When I think about Lamia being the first Iraqi woman to be in a foreign excavation, that is mind boggling to me. I didn't really realize that before. Can you talk a little bit more about what what that was like and what, what her and Selma's experience would have been like um, and what you saw them able to do in the field? Well, it was it was it would have been very shameful at that time for a woman to be out with a bunch of foreigners, absolutely shameful. But because of her, you know, her position in that family, and there is this there's this sort of a religious caste to that family, she was able to do it. Besides, you know, I think she would have insisted on doing it anyway. And so in, uh, I remember with, uh, in the case of Selma, Selma comes home to her, father, to her mother and says, they've asked me, the, the director general, who at that time was Faisal al-Waili, who was one of the very best directors they ever had. Faisal had asked her if she would be willing to go out with these crazy Americans 
to Abu Salabik and Nippur. And she wanted to go very badly. And she went home and she talked to her mother and mama, they want me to go. What do you think? Ma, what do you think? What do you think? She said, oh, you couldn't possibly. Oh no, it would be, it would be just too shameful. Yeah, but Lemia is doing it. Oh, well, I, I don't know. Talk to your father. So she mm -hmm. goes and talks to her father. And she says, uh, you know, they've asked me to come and I want to go. He said, what, what? He, he looks at her and he says, what does an archaeologist do? She said, well, you know, we prepare, uh, we prepare for publication. We do, we go on digs and we dig things up. He said, well, that's, does that answer your question? Because at that time, Iraqi women were not running their own digs. But it turns out, I think it's the first one. Lemia is the first Iraqi woman to run her own excavation, which she, uh, you're going to be hearing about from Abu Amir also. Uh, and she, she was really a, a, a trailblazer and uh, it was very, very important for, for getting people into the field. And later on, it, it, especially in the, in the 70s, women were encouraged to go out on, and run their own digs. In fact, in most cases, they were all female digs. There were, uh, we had these salvage projects. And uh, people would go out and they would, you'd go and you'd find out there are eight women on this dig. There are no men around at all, except for the people doing the digging. Uh, but that wasn't always the case. I mean, very often they, 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 they were, there were mixes. I mean, they, they, it was a different time. You probably can't, you couldn't do it now, but you could do it then. Okay. Thank you. Um, we did have a question. Does anyone or, you know, Mac, do you know if, um, it appears Lamia was working on a book about her life. Do you know if she was able to finish it before her passing? I don't think she was. I, I don't think she finished it. Okay. Um, I also have a question. I was wondering. She was, yeah, she was also working on a book on the uh, history of the Iraq Museum, which would have been very, very interesting. Right. Yeah. Amy? Yeah, um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about her interaction with the Nimrud materials when. She was studying the seals. She went after the excavations and looked at okay. them in the museum. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. She was very, very important in the uh, in the aftermath of the uh, destruction of the Iraq Museum, and uh, the for a while, people were worried that that material had been looted when the museum was looted in two thousand three. But I knew that that material had been in the basement of the central bank since nineteen ninety one, and I knew it because. Uh, Dr. Donnie George told me he had put, he was one of the ones who had put it in the in, 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 in the vault. He had been back to check on it every year all through the all through the 90s during the embargo. It was still there. There were lots of there was lots of nonsense uh, in in the foreign press as well as in the, uh, in the Iraq around the Iraq that Saddam had given the jewels to uh, his his wife and girlfriends mm -hmm. that they were wearing it around. It was all nonsense. It was all nicely contained in in uh, crates in the Iraq Museum. In 2003, and in 1991, that bank was hit with a bomb, but it did not penetrate deep enough to bother the vault in which those objects were. In 2003, however, uh, again, it was bombed because there was a telecommunications center, you know, they, they had telecommunications outside the country because it was a bank. It was hit again by a bomb, but again, it didn't, it didn't disturb what went on down below. What happened was, that looters got down into the bank, into the vaults, which are about 50 feet below ground. And they tried to open this vault. Uh, there are about five doors, I think. They, they tried to open this vault with a bazooka and it killed the people who tried to do it. And, but what it did was to trigger a system, it damaged the door enough so the water got in, but it, 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 uh, it triggered a system which floods the basement. Now, whether that's deliberate and that's part of the security of the building or whether that is by accident. Anyway, it flooded the basement and all that material got wet. Right. The, after, in, after the war, in about a month and a half after the war was finished, the, the uh, National Geographic paid to get the water out of the basement, out of the walls. And uh, the museum staff went down with uh, Bogdanos and uh, his crew and they opened the vault and they saw the damage that had been done. It had, it had been, uh, that particular vault had been water damaged. They got the material out. They took it to the Iraq Museum. Lemia was very much part of how, does we, how do we deal with it? How does the British Museum get involved? The British Museum came in and did restoration on objects. 
they did as much as they could on it. I'm afraid that some of the most in, uh, incredible of the objects were damaged by that water damage. And they got it, they conserved what they could, and they put it on display one day, 14th of July uh, in uh, 1992. They put it on display. And there, it was all done, it's all back, it's all finished. That was the end of the, of the Iraq Museum story. It, it was no longer, it was media dead. Uh, but in fact, what they did was to take it back off. They put it on display one day, they took it off display. The next day they put it into, uh, and it went back into storage and it still has not come out. The displays that you see in the, in the Iraq Museum now, uh, are, they're magnificent. There's some wonderful stuff on display that I've never seen before in my life. But the Queen's Tombs, as far as I know, is still not on display and probably should stay off display until things are much more stable. Anyway, that's, uh, anyway she had a lot to do with, with uh, dealing with the British Museum and dealing, again, as a buffer between the two. Ablomir, did you want to say something? Oh, well, yes, of course, I, uh, I, I was there when they took this uh, you know, treasure of uh, Nimrud and display it in the Iraqi Museum in July 2003. We, we, we were all there and uh, they, you know, take it back to the uh, Central Bank of Iraq and they're still there. Not only the Nimrud staff, it's also uh, uh, some staff from Ur, the Royal Cemetery of Ur, uh, the treasure of Harba, the ancient, uh, the Islamic city of uh, Harba near Samara, and also the treasure of Ambar. All of them, all of these, you know, four the treasures are in the central, you know, bank of, 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 of Iraq. And it's uh, really difficult to go there. I believe we checked it one time years ago and uh, it was there. Everything was there, yeah, I, I believe. And uh, as, as you said, well, we need to keep it there. Okay, we're at 9.22. Um, I think, yes. Uh, yeah, 22 seconds, that's not bad. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions for Mac before we move on to Dr. Alhamdani? That feels like a no. Okay. Okay. Uh, as I said, archeologist and former minister of culture, uh, tourism and Antiquities, Dr. Abdul Amir Al Hamdani is going to do our next presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Amanda, and uh, thank you so much for uh, you know Tari to invite me to talk today about the late uh, Lamia Galani. I'm going to use some slides, uh, and as you know, Max said, as uh, you know, Professor McGuire Gibson said. Uh, she was the first archaeologist, female archaeologist, I believe, in Iraq, was Salma Radi. Um, that's just really uh, in the early, early in, in the Middle East, not only in Iraq, but also in the, in the Middle East, to have women involved in archaeology and antiquities, not only doing museum uh, activities, but also going to the field and conducting survey and collecting data besides, you know, excavation. Um, so uh, the, uh, she started working with the State Board of Antiquities in 1961-62 and uh, she also uh, working with the, with the Iraqi Museum, uh, preparing uh, the museum in 1964 to be opened in 1966, as you know, Max said, and uh, she also uh, founded or started to, to found the Children's Museum, the Child Museum attached to the Iraqi Museum, as you can see in the picture. Uh, it's part of the uh, Iraqi Museum and the, the you know, Children's Museum was open until 2003. And um, so in 1974, she started uh, thinking of establishing that museum together with other uh, archaeologists like Donna George and uh, Moya Said of Banan Busuf. So she is the one who behind uh, this uh, museum, which is very important for uh, Iraqi, uh, you know, children to go there and to see uh, these, you know, displays. Now, not only in the museum, but also she involved in <clears throat> doing some Fieldwork, as you know, Max said, she was one of the representative 
of Iraqi State Board of Antiquities to work with the international expedition, but also she also uh, worked with the national expedition, specifically in Tel Dubai in the central of Baghdad, as uh, like uh, on the other side of the of the river, and uh, the expedition led by uh, uh, Hazim and uh, Najafi. And she was very active member in the excavation. Tel Dubai is an as as an old Babylonian settlement, uh, Isilar's old Babylonian settlement, and uh, she discovered a lot of uh, uh, things. And she published an article in in, in Sumer in nineteen sixty five that was an early publication for her. And uh, you know the material that they found is like. A lot of you know kiln to to bake you know uh, pottery, and uh, it is the uh, it is the first you know workshop or you know kiln to produce uh, ceramic and other uh, small stuff, and uh, then she left Iraq uh, in seventies, going back to England, and then she never came until like. She came in 1991, but the the most important work of her in 2003, when we went back to Iraq as a part of the Iraqi Reconstruction and Development Council with the uh, with the uh, coalition forces, together with Ismail uh, Hajara, Zainab Al Bahrani, and John Russell, and she 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 did you know work with the State Board of Antiquities and, as an advisor. And also with the museum uh, from 2003 and 2004, she was focusing on, you know, cylinder seals and how to do this. And um, after 2003, uh, indeed, uh, during and after the war of 2003, many objects have been looted from archaeological sites, specifically in the south. I was working there to stop the looting. and. Uh, Every time I come to the museum, she would ask me if there are any cylinder seals uh, with you. I, uh, I said, well, I got uh, some stolen objects from the looters and from the smugglers. I returned back to the Iraqi museum, almost 30,000 stolen objects. And from 2003 to 2005, every time I come to the museum, she would say, uh, Amir, is there any cylinder seal in this uh, collection? So she was, you know, looking for for uh, cylinder seals and and uh, also making an account for what had been looted from the Iraqi museum. And uh, but the program is 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 ended in two thousand and four. But she remained in in Iraq, worked to the museum, organizing and cataloging uh, what has been left from the looting and also. Uh, working on the new coming artifacts from looting. Uh, thousands of artifacts have been taken back to the Iraqi museum. So she was involving in training the staff and developing the uh, catalogs. And she also w went down to the st storing room in the Iraqi museum. Uh, and uh, she continued continued to work with the with the museum to advise them in many and many aspects uh, not only making an, an inventory to the uh, material but also uh, in you know co conservation and uh, uh, restoration well so that, that was the Iraqi museum and also she went uh, to to the field also to check some some of the archaeological sites specifically in the in the north and also she involved in assessing the condition of uh, of Babylon uh, that, that was occupied by the American forces so she was involving in kind of you know writing uh, you know reports about Babylon and other targeted site by uh, either occupation or looters. And now, so uh, th then she moved to uh, establish the, uh, you know, Basra Museum uh, from 2013 to 2016. She was involved in 
establishing or uh, establishing the Basra Museum. Indeed, the Basra Museum was uh, Saddam Hussein Palace. So she worked with the with the friends of uh, Basra Museum to convert this palace into museum, which is important for the people of Basra. It's no, it's not a museum; it's a cultural center, indeed. And part of it was used as a museum, as you can see here in the picture. So she was, you know, m moving. She was, you know, moving from London to Baghdad to Basra, back and, and forth. Worked very hard. I met her, you know, several times there, and I was there in the opening ceremony in 2016. And uh, she stayed there uh, to to help the people in displaying artifacts. And she insisted that we have to to give the Basra mu Museum artifacts, not only representing Basra history, which mostly Islamic era, but also some stuff from other cities and other civilizations. So it was a kind of a, a complete display similar to what we have in the Iraqi museum from early times until Ottoman era. And then she moved to Soleimani Museum to help the people there also, uh, in, you know, displaying the artifacts. And mo most of the, of the time she and Farouk Rawi Farouk Harawi was working on cuneiform tablets in Soleimani Museum, and she was uh, working on the uh, cylinder seals. And uh, then in 2015, from 2015 until 2019, she involved and worked with the, a project of, of Columbia University and uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, in a program called the, F the Future of the Past. And this was really organized by Zainab al-Bahrani and Joanne Aruz. And most of the data that I, I got now, uh, it came from Zainab al-Bahrani. So thanks for Zainab to uh, provide you with this uh, data. So she continued, the, the uh, program continued uh, workshop and courses in Istanbul and Amman. And she, so she will be, it's like she, she, she moved from the UK to, to Iraq to Amman to organize this uh, workshop and courses. And uh, she was involved in all these uh, meeting and courses and uh, at that time, uh, people, staff of the State Board of Antiquities from different provinces invited to, to Amman. So she was checking everything with them and making as a, as a what's called, as a, 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 a contact point for all of these things, organizing the, those things. Kind of a coordinator between Colombia, the Met and the State Board of Antiquities. And um, so, yes, she was also involving in teaching the museum staff how to write, a, a, you know, labels and description for all th this, you know, object. And she continued working on that until uh, her death. And indeed, in uh, January uh, 22nd, 23rd uh, of 2019. And as you know, Max said, she's from a, a very distinguished family called Al, Al Gailani. And uh, so she involved in uh, protecting Iraqi uh, heritage. And for her, it was, it was her heritage. It was, you know, more than, than just, you know, d doing work, but also uh, coordinating with the Iraqi, you know, government and also with the uh, international community, with international institution, kind of, you know, coordinating the work of the State Board of Antiquities with the international community, with universities and institutions and centers. Uh, I, I got last email from her a week before her death. It was January 13, 2019. She uh, sent me an email uh, saying, Amir, we are going to do this, this, and that for the uh, workshop. And also she asked me to give a permit to the director of Basra Museum to 
or join the the one of the workshop. It indeed was the last workshop for her, unfortunately, and then she passed away on the 22nd of January, and there was a, a, a funeral for her at the Iraqi Museum, and uh, then she buried in, in the shrine of her grandfather, uh, Abdul Qadir Gailani, and we, st we are still remembering her and uh, her work with the Iraqi Museum to train the people. And uh, when, I, when I said there will be a, a, a session about Lamia Gailani uh, with Tari, every, everybody was saying this is a good thing to do. So I, I believe now all the st staff in the st State Board of Antiquities and the Iraqi Museum remember her forever. And I think I have to stop now because this is my last uh, slide. And if there is any question and comment, I will be more than happy to deal with. Thank you for that. That was very interesting. Um, well, thank you to Joan for sending a link to uh, Dr. Agalani's uh, presentation from November of 2017 on the history of the Iraq Museum. I sent that to everyone in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, does anyone have any questions for Dr. Alhamdani? Anyone from our panel or in the group? Uh, I can. Yeah, I stand corrected. She she wasn't the director of Dubai, but she was. She, she got the publications out, and she was. She was very important in doing that sort of thing. But she, you know, it was important that she was on that dig. Mm. It helped that it was right in right in Baghdad. Right. What is now part of Baghdad. So she, she was able to go home at night and come back the next morning. Anything else? We do have uh, three minutes, about five minutes. No. Okay. Um, well, I will. I will be adding uh, just you know one one thing. You know, uh, thanks for uh, the friends of uh, Basra Museum to help us to establish the the museum. And Juan Porter is here, so th thank you, Juan, for supporting us, supporting the State Board of Antiquities in establishing the Basra Museum. Oh, I, I forgot one other thing. Uh, it was from Lemia that we got the color slides that made it possible to do the color illustrations in the Nimrud Queen's book. Oh. Uh, she had a copy of them, so, and she was able to, she turned them over to us. I, I, I also should mention that uh, the publication of those Iraqi archeological reports and the Nimrud tombs, were all part, they were paid for by a project which we uh, were able to get uh, funds for from the State Department. So that the, uh, they're directly uh, as part of TARI. So TARI is responsible for the uh, existence of, all, of the, all those articles by Iraqi archeologists and the Nibu Queens because it was subvented by TARI. Some of them has, have been published in Akadika, right? In yeah, Akadika, Akadika and, and, and in journal Iraq. Mm. Um, we have a question. The seal catalog um, from the Iraq Museum, is that available anywhere for people that she was working on or that she did? Sorry. No. No. I don't think it was, um, I don't think it was published yet. I'm not sure who's, uh, if he may know what, what the status of that is. I, I, this is Joan. I can unmute. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, hi, everybody. Um, hi. So uh, it has not been published. Um, one of one of the things that Abdul Amir and all of us will be a bit regretful is that she was so busy with everybody helping everybody that a lot of the things that she wanted to publish, which we all know about, including the history of the Iraq Museum, um, I don't think are going to come to pass unless somebody wants to do a lot of research. Nora, her daughter, has gone through the computers to see what she could find, and it doesn't seem to be quite enough. But um, 
the link that you have is great. And um, one of the things I want to say is that when we did the first training program at the Boston Museum in January, 2018, we had a series of disasters of people appearing. So Lamia gave the first talk and she spoke to all the Iraqi uh, curators and people from all over about the history of the Iraq Museum. And it was about, it was wonderful. And of course she did it in Arabic. And um, they were learning things that they had no idea about their own background in their own country. So someday with all these various things we have, somebody does need to put that together. Um, but I would also just um, say that her time with the Boston Museum, the Friends of Boston Museum actually goes all the way back to uh, 2010. And um, Ablamir is correct. The first um, opening was 2016 when he was there. And then the second opening happened in 2019 after she died and we all were um, in, in memory. Um, Abdul Amir was very helpful in making sure that the artifacts that had been selected did get to Basra. So um, she, she was very strong-willed as you've all pointed out. And um, I think probably she drew, drew, uh, drove a few people crazy, but she did manage to get the, um, the artifacts uh, that she wanted and quite a few of the cylinder seals that she wanted to the Boston Museum. So one day those cylinder seals will indeed be um, uh, put into a, a, a kind of booklet, so. Thank you so much for that, John. Do we have any other questions um, or comments? No? Okay. Um, Next, we have Dr. Katherine Hansen of the Smithsonian Institution. I believe she has a presentation for us as well. Thank you, one moment. There we go. All right, everyone can see this and I'm off mute. Those are the two most important things. Um, so I, I wanted to thank Amanda for organizing this session and for Tari and um, also just express my honor to be presenting in a session um, on, on uh, about uh, Dr. Lamia. The Nimrud Rescue Project is something that she advised on. And I just wanna start really briefly on a personal note. Um, as Mac mentioned, and I learned even more detail on, uh, she really paved the way for women in Iraqi archaeology, specifically Iraqi women in archaeology. But she also sort of was very expansive in her sense of mentorship and her sense of encouragement. And um, I shared these images with you from a 2015 uh, conference that a University of Pennsylvania's Cultural Heritage Center put together in Istanbul. And it was at a relatively low moment. Um, my colleague up there, Layla, uh, and myself and uh, a number of others were at this conference and ISIS had been just rampaging through uh, the ISIS held areas and destroying quite a bit. And it was, it was a really difficult time uh, professionally. <laughs> and um, it, was, it was so profound to have Lamia who had been through um, you know, the aftermath of the 2003 war, who had been through the aftermath of uh, the 1991 war and, and basically encourage us and tell us to keep going. And um, I just, I just wanna spend a, a, just a few moments here um, expressing my gratitude for getting to have that experience with her because I think her motivation um, for so many of us was really something that got us to, um, to dig a little bit deeper. She was so active and so busy with the work she was doing um, that even in some of the moments it seemed uh, uh, quite, quite dark after destruction, um, she was really able to bring together people and resources. Um, so uh, it's in this role basically as a mentor advisor, um, sort of a networker extraordinaire uh, and uh, someone who was, as Mac mentioned earlier, she's very, very good at communicating between um, other organizations, international organizations and Iraqi organizations. And I think that is a unique skill set that we especially miss these days. Um, so I'm gonna, be, uh, I'm gonna be talking about a specific project that she served as an advisor on called the Nimrud Project. Um, and it's really an outgrowth of her work as a connector and as a mentor. Um, 
So uh, on, this, on this paper and with this project in general, um, I have four co-authors. Uh, the first, Zaid Al Ghazi, is the director of the Mosul Museum uh, at Nineveh uh, SBAH office in Mosul. Um, and he's in charge of the Nimrud Rescue Project uh, Mosul team. And uh, my uh, colleague, Jesse Johnson, is uh, head of conservation at Smithsonian. Uh, Brian Leone is uh, in head, basically head of the logistical parts of the Iraq product programs at Smithsonian. Um, and Ken Severson, who um, is a stone conservator and large objects conservator, which we have needed quite a bit at Nimrud. Uh, so uh, uh, Lamia served as on the uh, Stabilization Guidance Committee uh, for the Nimrud Rescue Project, really from its beginning. Um, she was one of the first people that Jesse and I called for advice about what we should do. Um, we had been asked at that point in time to, um, Smithsonian had been asked by SBAH to work, uh, State Board of Antiquities and Heritage, excuse me, um, uh, deputy office within the Ministry of Culture in Iraq, and um, to assist with Nimrud, that uh, Smithsonian came to them, asked them, you know, what, what can Smithsonian do to help, and uh, SBAH asked us to help with Nimrud. And I don't need to introduce Nimrud to this audience, I don't think. I think everybody here knows it. It's an incredibly famous site. It's in northern Iraq. Um, it's about, uh, it's just south of Mosul, around between 20 and 30 kilometers. Um, very, very famous Neo-Assyrian site, best known for its period in the Neo-Assyrian. Um, I like to say that it was in some ways at that time, around say 800 BC, it was Rome before there was Rome, right? It controlled an empire that stretched from the Gulf to the Mediterranean. And I oversimplify this, but I, I always highlight that. I always highlight that it's mentioned in the Bible multiple times, uh, specifically to American audiences, because I really want to convey how important this site is and that it is a place where Everyone who grew up in the area went there in elementary school. It's a tourist destination if you're Iraqi. It's a tourist destination if you're from an inter the international community and you're visiting Iraq. Um, it's, it's a really renowned site and it was particularly renowned um, for its uh, Neo-Assyrian reliefs, one of which you see um, on the site there on the left, and then um, its standing remains. So some of the reconstruction and then also the ziggurat that were on the site. Uh, this entirety was heavily destroyed by ISIS. Um, here you see the barrel bombs lined up against those reliefs. You see the jackhammering to destroy them. I'm not going to dwell on this, but the, the explosion of the Northwest Palace there. Uh, and this is an alternate view, um, which was then coupled with destruction that piecemeal occurred later. Very, very performative acts. And so this is the before and after that I tend to focus on because this is the entrance to the Northwest Palace. You have the before there in 2009, and then you have the after when ISIS was cleared and they were able to get back to the site in 2000 and documented back in 2017. Um, and you see those Lamasu there, the human headed uh, winged bull statues, just completely, completely blown apart. Um, there's plenty of um, fragmentary sculptures and because the reconstruction and the roofing that had so long protected the Northwest Palace was blown off, um, the fragments, what we're finding the last few years since they've been exposed to the elements is that uh, it's Mosul marble, it's a limestone, uh, it is eroding in the, in the rain. So I'm gonna show you a couple pictures of what happened to some of the other areas that aren't the Northwest Palace like the Nabu Temple here. Um, and then, Oh, that, sorry, I'm trying to make this shorter. Uh, so in, in January 2017, just as the uh, ISIS was pushed out, we, Smithsonian, uh, had a meeting with then uh, Deputy Minister, uh, Deputy in Charge Chairman of State Board of Integrities and Heritage, um, Kais Rashid, who, when Smithsonian said, what can we do to help post-ISIS, he said, please come to Nimrud. And I have to be honest, I actually tried, as the, as the Smithsonian archeologist on the team, I tried to talk them out of it at first because it's too big a site. But I'm really glad I lost because Nimrud is far too important. Um, and it has been really, really powerful to be able to work with uh, 
the Nimrud rescue team on this. So this is the group that met to discuss the initial, the, sort of the uh, initial beginnings of the project in 2017. This is where the training has taken place at the Iraqi Institute for the Conservation of Antiquities and Heritage up in um, Erbil. And that means that the uh, most of the team, most of the Nimrud rescue team, it's about 20 people is based in Mosul. A couple folks are from the village next to Nimrud and they've been able to come get together and come to Erbil um, for training from international scholars um, and sort of planning meetings and they're able to um, go forward. One of the folks I want to thank who's on this, uh, who's participating in the Zoom call right now is Corey Wegner, who's also from the Smithsonian, who's been very active in this project and uh, her, her team has been um, particularly helpful in what this emergency response that's going on. Um, so what you're looking at here is a satellite image of the before and after. Um, one of the things you'll notice is that the ziggurat is leveled. Um, and that occurred at the very end of ISIS's occupation there. And then it was seeded with explosives. Uh, so that's a close up image of that. And then this is what the view of the site looks like. Um, it, is, it is heartbreaking. Uh, for most archeologists, any of this destruction is heartbreaking. It is, it's been uh, very, very uh, sad to see. And like I showed in that picture from 2015 um, with Lamia, I, I can get very focused on this destruction, but I think what I wanna focus on instead is uh, my Iraqi colleagues, um, the folks on the Mosul, res or excuse me, the Nimrud rescue team um, who are coming from Mosul and the local villages um, who are literally picking up the pieces and are going to allow the site to eventually be rebuilt and to become a destination again. And so I'm just gonna show you uh, quickly some, some images from the project. Um, we've had two field seasons so far. Uh, the, the third is sort of ongoing. It's a little difficult in COVID times, but thankfully it's outdoor activity. So they are able to get outside and check on the site. Um, and they are going forward with a third season as soon as possible. What you see here is practice that took place in Erbil with the planning meetings, um, attempting to figure out what was going to be done first. The site, uh, this heavily damaged, needed quite a bit of, um, of approach. And one of the big things we did, um, borrowing a methodology that uh, Corey Wegner has used in many other places, um, is to create a grid. Um, and so we did that through satellite imagery, and then we did that on the, literally on the ground, and we practiced levels of grids um, so that everything that was picked up from the site was picked up in a systematic way. It's very similar to um, what you would consider landscape survey archeology, span um, that everything was gridded out, that we knew the location of where everything came from, that we were able to practice both doing so um, in more controlled, smaller environments, and then out in the field. This is particularly important for the very large fragments of sculpture. And so here you see practicing on lifting concrete blocks to mimic what has since happened with, um, with the Lamassu. Uh, the most important part is the least sexy by far, and that is what happens afterwards with the paperwork and the documentation. Um, and so here you see the lab work, the cleaning off of the objects, the writing the paperwork up, um, documenting where it came from, um, you don't see the back end here of all of the photo documentation, but that part has really been key, um, as has using geotextiles and um, rubble to basically protect sculptures that are currently exposed to the elements from further erosion. So that's been a, that was pretty much the first priority of the team. And then the next, the, one of the big activities that's taken place um, has been the construction of the shed. Um, so this is the new storage facility on the site. Um, this is where all of the systematically collected fragments are being picked up and stored. And so I think, I think this is my last one. And so with that, I think I'm gonna end with that same image. Um, and so this is the before, this is what the, the large llama Sioux there looked like before. Um, and then this is, this is what it looked like after. You see those little paws down there. And uh, I just, I just want to highlight again that, that we talk a lot about destruction in Iraq. And um, when I give public lectures, 
um, and I say, you know, a Mesopotamian archaeologist, the first thing anybody asks me, particularly to an audience here in Washington, D.C., is, well, is there anything left there? Because didn't ISIS destroy everything? And I have to explain that, um, that well, first, archaeological sites have a lot of layers. And second, of course, there's stuff left there. Even the absence of stuff, that space is still important. And uh, one of the ways that we're able to keep working there is through the invitation and collaboration of um, our Iraqi colleagues who feel that this site is the most important for them to get back to. And so I can focus quite a bit on the destruction and the different, you know, the, the different levels of erosion and loss that we're facing. Um, but really what I want folks to look at are those folks in the, in the vests, in the yellow vests, in the distance in this image, because um, those are the guys out there in the field literally picking up the pieces and uh, making sure that Nimrud is able to be preserved for another day and, uh, and that we'll, we'll have visitors again in the future. And uh, I want to circle back to the fact that I think what Lamia, what Dr. Lamia was able to do when she served on the Nimrud um, Advisory Committee and Stabilization Committee was connect us to both the British folks that were working on it. So the Smithsonian, she connected us to British folks who were working on it or had connections. Um, she connected us to everybody in Iraq who might be interested in the Nimrud Rescue Project and helped us navigate um, some conversations and uh, particularly uh, as we were at the same time juggling issues with demining the site and other aspects um, that she really really was a driving force on that and we very much miss her in that role um, and with that I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you Catherine. Um, we still have about eight seven minutes left. Um, if there's any, oh, we do have a question. Um, let me, sorry, I mute everyone while you're talking. Um, if you, if somebody wants to, to pose a question, feel free. If, uh, Catherine, you want to add anything or if we have any other comments from the panelists on this particular presentation. Um, Catherine, one of the questions is, have you found many epigraphic remains during recovery? So uh, there's a lot of cuneiform on the site, um, if, if that's the question. Um, the, across much of the sculptural reliefs, there's, there's the annals and it, uh, it's, not, um, it's not prolific, but there's certainly cuneiform on the reliefs that have been decimated and it's a little difficult to um, to to really parse out how much um, how much exactly has been there um, is there in terms of that um, if you know some uh, aspiring Assyriologists who want to come and uh, put literal pieces back together of cuneiform let me know uh, we'll be looking for that in a couple of years when we get all those pieces back together um, but I do want to just also in case this was a misunderstanding. Do you want to really strongly reiterate, we are not excavating. This is, this is purely, except when absolutely necessary because ISIS dig, dig, did dig some trenches and uh, some local folks also might have dug into some parts of the site. Um, other than in those particular instances where we're stabilizing a location where there's been a lot of an erosion slide, there is no excavation. So there have been no intentional new discoveries. If that's if that's the question, um, we we're really literally picking up the pieces um, and trying to put them back together in an organized way in the storage facility. And then thankfully, um, reconstruction is not a decision that we the Smithsonian is involved in. That we are just there to help stabilize and document. Okay, um, we have two questions here. Um, there are still hundreds of fragments, some large, and they are not in storage. Have they been affected by erosion? So this is um, this is the uh, this is, there's a little bit of a, a ethical issue, right? Between do you pick things up in a strategic way, uh, knowing where they came from, 
or do you just run out there and grab all of the big important pieces? And a mix has happened. The very, very biggest pieces were initially covered with tarps to protect them from the erosion. They were too, far too big to move into storage. Um, it actually took quite a bit to get movers up there to get some of that and, and quite a bit still needs to be moved in. So when I talk about some of that geotextile and um, rubble coverings to protect against erosion, some of that's what's been, what's been happening. Um, we, uh, we are hopeful that most of the stuff that is currently still facing erosion is the smaller stuff, but it's really hard to, hard to tell. And um, the, the systematic approach to this is because that blast really sent things everywhere. And we wanna make sure that we're going through and carefully getting every single small piece. Um, and what happens now for the future of the site? So, oh, hey, you know what I didn't do? Let me share, I have to share one more slide, I apologize. Um, I, there we go. That would be my acknowledgements page. Um, <laughs> and we are generously funded um, primarily through the US Department of State um, and they have continued our funding. So we are secure for a few more years. We plan to have several more field seasons. Um, we've also uh, been supported by a lot of other foundations um, and, and we're quite, quite grateful for the support from Smithsonian um, among other, plenty of other organizations and especially uh, the State Board of Antiquities and Heritage and the Ministry of Culture. Um, and so it's with that uh, that, uh, I want to just say that we are we are funded for the future. We have we have projects, and we're working towards, uh, like everybody, a more digital platform during COVID times. And um, thankfully, the team is able to get out to the site, and we're pretty sure the third field season is going to going to happen here at some point. Okay, um, we do have somebody who wants to come up and, and ask a question directly. You should be able. Uh, to unmute yourself, let me double check, yep, and start your video, if you'd like to do that. Hi, um, Kathleen, hello, hello everyone. Um, I was recently in the area, I went to visit Ashur. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, Ashur is another case altogether. Luckily, we didn't face the type of destruction that the road faced. Thank God for that. But in relation to this site, you know, uh, we have colleagues in, um, in and around Nimrod um, from Mosul University, but also from um, Tikrit University. And they sent me videos and photos of the site. And I think you've answered some of the questions, but um, we literally saw, I mean, from the videos, we literally saw pieces, some of them quite large, I mean, literally hundreds of pieces, some of them the size, you know, about this size, still strewn all over the site. Right. Um, and I was quite worried that those, um, you know, th those, those, Fragments could be, um, given the Iraq is still in an unstable situation, um, you know, there could be multiple wars ahead, we don't know. And, and the, the urgency of storing and, and, and using, you know, taking those to storage, but also potentially, um, you know, taking them to Baghdad if it's a possibility, um, or using them in a, in a way that can actually, or using this project to protect um, further the, those. Um, those fragments because there are literally hundreds and hundreds of those um, and also it's also important to understand also is that there are lots of questions about this project from local academics and, and architects uh, archaeologists um, and I think it's really important to to write something in Arabic potentially um, that could be distributed to people to understand the particulars of this project perhaps also the, the difficulty particularly when it comes to identifying collating and, and because obviously that takes time. And I think that needs to be done. And it's not just your project, but it's across the board. Um, we need more of that information in Arabic so people can actually feel certain and, and content that there is some support on the ground. Um, I, I think that's really, really important. I've been speaking to lots of donors about this, that they could potentially incorporate this into their uh, funding streams. That that this is an important aspect of any work is to connect to local communities and explain these processes um, rather than it being just a, uh, an issue associated with institutions. Those are fabulous questions and I'm gonna try and get 
to all your points. Um, if I don't, just pop back on and tell me. Um, so I should say first that um, on the publication in Arabic front, um, this is, you. your point is so well made. And um, I share your frustration with a lot of particularly the international projects right now um, and in the past, uh, not, not having anything that's accessible. And that's both in publications and in writing, but also because I work a lot on the digital side with the mapping and the GIS and the GPS and the digital photos. And who owns that in the long term and where that long term permanently resides is a really, really important question. And one that I worry, I mean, it's, it's one of the things I worry the most about that we're handling um, well for the Nimri project because um, the way, way it's done right now is that we have basically a shared Dropbox between um, what Zaid Al-Ghazi has, um, my co-author in Mosul, and then what we have at Smithsonian. And um, when it comes to actual publications, um, like, oh, so many archeological projects, we are waiting till we were, we were waiting till we were a couple of seasons in before we were able to actually get something out and written. Um, I know uh, Zaid Al-Ghazi, along with some colleagues, has an uh, article in, I think maybe to Sumer, or is proposing an article in to Sumer. Um, there's, it's a, there's a draft manuscript in Arabic that should be coming out in the um, foreseeable future. Uh, for security reasons in the beginning, we were quite quiet about it. Um, we certainly didn't want to plant a big flag and say, hey, foreigners are coming to hang out at Nimrud. Um, that was a terrible plan. <laughs> Particularly Americans were coming to hang out at Nimrud. Um, and we are very conscious of uh, stepping back, it, particularly for security reasons, um, with colleagues, uh, with, with the Nimrud rescue team, with colleagues specifically in Mosul. Um, I, I hope that that answers some of your questions about publications. I really do share your frustration that there is too little in Arabic and there's too little published period on what's, especially what's currently going on. Um, the, the, your other main question about fragments on the site, um, it is, I had no idea explosions of an archeological site would create, I mean, I just, I don't think any of us knew that this type of damage was possible um, at an archeological site. You're absolutely right that there is, um, there's fragments all over the place. Uh, it is very much uh, like landscape archeology span in that if it's not done systematically, certain pieces and areas will be missed. The really big stuff has been covered and stabilized um, and they're going sort of as quickly as COVID and the weather will permit. Um, but yeah, your, your point is there's still a lot of work to do. Um, I can assure you from a security standpoint, the very first thing that was built um, after we might have guilted UNESCO, is this being, oh, this is being recorded, whoops. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we had a conversation with UNESCO um, about making sure that the site needed to be secure. And um, they very quickly ponied up the funds to put a very large fence around the site. So the citadel itself is, um, is encased in a pretty high fence. The Iraqi army has had folks there almost consistently um, with only a couple of breaks since the area was first liberated. Um, and that's because it, it was used by ISIS when they, the Iraqi army was initially coming through. Um, the army is very aware of it because we had to have quite a bit of demining action done on the site. Um, in the very beginning. Uh, but yeah, the security of the site is important. Um, it continues to have a site guard there that lives on the site. Um, and I hope that continues. We, we think it will. We're working with, um, one of the current projects actually is uh, working on some other site security measures like lighting and things like that. It's a long winded answer. Um, if, if, there's ones, if there's parts of your questions I missed, um, or there's, there's other stuff I can address, I can shoot you my email um, in the chat function here and I'd be happy to talk more in depth. Thank you for that. Um, and that actually brings us in on time. Uh, if we have any extra time at the end, we can, we can try and address any more questions that have been left. 
Next, we have Dr. Amy Gunsel of St. John's University, and I believe she's also going to give us a presentation, PowerPoint. Okay, hello everybody. Thank you um, for joining us today. I'm very thankful also for Tari organizing this session um, and for AIA hosting it. When I saw it advertised, I, I thought this is the opportunity that, um, you know, another opportunity for all of us to publicly honor Dr. Wur. And um, I am particularly honored to have a chance to share my perspectives. Um, for me, Dr. Wur, um, as an individual and for the field, I just saw her as a, as a great role model. She's a role model for curators, for archaeologists, for women, uh, for Iraqis, and as has been noted, especially for Iraqi women. Um, my perspective that I'm going to um, share with you is more distant maybe than some of the presentations that we've heard so far um, from being a, a lifelong friend and having professional collaborations. My perspective is more coming from that of a student and then a researcher. But I think this is a really important perspective to share because it shows how Dr. Wer touched so many people, touched so many individuals and inspired them. And through that process of connecting to individuals working in the field, she touched and impacted a whole field for generations. So what I'm going to share first briefly are just um, kind of my story of getting to know her and some sentiments. And then I'm going to transition to a short academic presentation um, that is in her honor. So I first became aware of Dr. Wer about 20 years ago as a student when I was studying cylinder seals and I was looking at her old Babylonian publications. So I knew her name, I knew her research, I knew her as a scholar. Then um, after I finished my PhD in 2008 to 2010, I worked at the Cultural Heritage Center of the State Department. And there, as we were working on Iraq museum projects, I would so often hear, we have to ask Lamia. Well, Lamia would know, but I was not the one to be doing the asking of Lamia. Um, I was not the one with the direct communication. I was the one in awe of her, in awe of her knowledge, her experience, her accomplishments, and so much that she was able to do for Iraq. And as others have said, and I will repeat, her role working between cultures, working between political entities to get things accomplished for the sake of the past and the future of Iraq it was just incredibly inspiring. So at the same time, in 2008, at the end of the year, the New Light on Nimrud book was published and um, Professor Gibson mentioned this also. In that book, it was a conference proceedings about the Queen's tombs of Nimrud. And she had a chapter on seals from the Nimrud tombs. At this time, I was just starting to um, conduct research on the Nimrud tombs. And in particular, when I saw her chapter and I knew her as an expert in seals, I, I thought, you know, this is going to be vital to my research. Um, so I had these connections with her through her writing. Our paths did not cross in person though, until 2014. And on that occasion, it was a Scholars Day Symposium in New York at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where we were both presenting. She was presenting on destruction to churches um, in Iraq, and I was presenting on the Queen's tomb. I wanted for this opportunity to, to meet her in person. I, I wanted to say something to her. I had so much to say, but I felt very shy. Um, I approached her at a break. She was so generous, of course, so warm. She, I sat down beside her. We talked about many things. And in that brief 
moment of, of interaction, I was absolutely infused with inspiration. Um, I was motivated. I was at my own kind of crossroads. I had just transitioned the year before out of um, work at the State Department and into full-time academia. I was just getting to the point um, where I was preparing a book proposal on the Queen's Tombs from Nimrud. I was thinking about how I was going to pull these things together and move forward in my, in my kind of new life um, conducting this research. And when I had the chance to just see in person who the person was who was doing all these things with this vast knowledge and all these accomplishments, I thought, of course, Amy, you can do your small part too. You know, you may feel overwhelmed. You're at the beginning, you need to just jump in there and you can do it too. Now, after having that brief personal interaction with her, um, and thank God I did at that time, it was just a few months later um, that the site of Nimrud was detonated, the Northwest Palace, of course. Um, and I think had I not had that moment of connection with Dr. Wer, um, that's one of the things that really helped me to stay inspired and stay focused, um, to be motivated to continue the research that I was doing. At that time, I began um, emailing her um, from time to time. It was mostly me asking questions, asking questions of her knowledge and expertise. What do you think of this? What might this mean? Um, do you have photos of this? Did you see this in person? She always responded very generously and usually very promptly also. Um, so I was, I was really honored to have the opportunity just to have that open channel of communication with her. But of course, when I did communicate with her, I, I would wait until my question was very clear. I didn't want to be nagging her. I wanted to, um, I knew how busy she was and I, I just wanted to kind of share in this conversation as researchers not to be putting demands upon her. So I would often wait before I would reach out to her till I, I knew I had a, a very clear communication and something to ask quite directly. So it was in this situation when I was looking at one of her drawings of a seal from the Nimrud tombs that is published in that new light in, on Nimrud book um, that I was really thinking, I, I need to talk to her. Um, she drew the, the one image that is published of this seal that shows details on it and different, slightly different perspectives than what you can see in the photograph. Um, I was preparing an email to her. The particular day I was, I took a break, I checked my own email, and I found out that she had passed away. So I never sent that email. It's not about me not getting the answers that I wanted about that seal. I always regret that I hesitated and I didn't, you know, continue that conversation with her that I know she would have um, enjoyed. She took joy, especially in, in cylinder seals. So that was one last kind of gift I, I couldn't give her. I, I um, regret that. And at the time I was thinking, oh, I'm going to do a presentation on the seal. I'm going to work it into an article. And after the situation passed, I thought, you know, I just, I can't move forward on that seal at this time. It will play a role in my research, but I need to come back to it when I'm ready. So when I saw this session advertised, I decided I have to be ready now. And so with that, I'm going to transition now to the academic portion of my presentation. And we're going to look at that seal together. I hope that we can puzzle through it um, kind of have fun with it for the sake of honoring something that Dr. Ware loved. So I'm going to share my screen and hopefully we will Okay. Are we all good? You can see on my screen? Yes. Yeah, you're good. Okay. Okay, thank you. All right, so this is the iconography of goddesses and queens on seals from the Nimrud tombs. That was kind of the big question that I'm asking of this seal. In fact, is this an image of a queen 
or a goddess? Who are the figures here? These are some of the questions that I had, some of the questions that I ponder today in her memory. And what you see here is an image of her drawing in the New Light on Nimrud book with my kind of frantic, confused notes all over the place that I'm just sharing with you. There are no answers there, but just to show you how I was kind of working through all the ideas coming together of what is this? Is this an image of a Neo-Assyrian queen? It's the figure here on the left that is in question. Or is it a goddess? We have very few images of queens and in the 2008 publication were actually suggested that this is a goddess. Another twist to whatever we're looking at in this scene is who is the beardless fellow behind the king? This person here, assuming it is a fellow. So the seal itself uh, was excavated from the coffin of Queen Hama as it is published in the Nimrud Queen's Tomb volume by um, Professor Hussein and edited by Professor Gibson that he had mentioned. You see the volume here with a brilliant photograph of this carnelian seal and an impression of it. So that is the only photograph that I have ever seen of it or seen of the impression it's published in this book. What the book also provides for us is the context of the excavated seal. And it is a striking context. As I said, it was found in Queen Hama's coffin at Nimrud with her inscribed stamp seal that you see here on the left, though the iconography on that differs from the Carnelian seal. It also was found with her crown, other examples of royal dress and regalia. Now, there are so many twists to kind of decoding the seal, the context, the iconography, the meaning, were in the 2008 chapter suggested that it might have come from a different coffin. So I would have liked to have been able to ask her why. There actually have been some other objects that have been questioned as to which coffin they might have come from and might they have been mixed up in antiquity when bodies were moved around or during excavation. So it would be quite informative to find out that the seal maybe came from the tomb of a eunuch or another royal person and not from the tomb of a queen. But for now, we're going with it's probably from Hama's tomb. Now we can take a closer look at her drawing and she was able to examine the seal in person. When you're looking at a seal directly as opposed to from the impression, sometimes you can observe slightly different details. And sometimes those details show up as less than what you see in the impression. I don't know if the extra spikes on the back of this tassel behind this figure and the extra spikes on the crown might have been marks made when the seal was rolled out just kind of from the sticky substance in which it was rolled um, because she doesn't draw them here. Um, it could have just been a... Um, briefer drawing than all the details that were present, but she was, um, you know, quite attentive to details. So I think that there may be issues here with the impression. Another question that I have, if you look at this beardless figure, it looks like there is maybe a band going around the head and you don't see a band there. Is this a cap? Is the band here just a figment of photography, a highlight, or is it something that was not included or does it maybe connect to this band down here? Again, if there were other photos or she might have remembered the seal herself, we could have more information about this. But this is the evidence we have to go on. So the first question is, is this an image of a queen? Well, if you look at the other images of queens, we have one from Hama's stamp seal here from the same coffin. You see the treatment of the headdress is very different here. She has a kind of headband with a um, ribbon going down her back. This figure has a ribbon going down the back, but definitely not a headband, some kind of a spiky box-like crown. Well, the crown found in Hama's coffin looks like this. Mm, does not really match what we see on the seal, but seals are very small. Maybe it's a stylized version of this type of crown. We don't know. My answer to many things is not an answer. It's a question of we don't know. 
So this crown might be described as a mural crown by some. I've heard it interpreted as such a crown of city walls like we see on, on Queen Labali Sharat from a slightly later era, the Queen of Ashurbanipal. You see her here with a very clearly delineated, um, crenellated crown. Do these turrets maybe match the spiky things we see on this crown from the Nimrud seal? Not sure. Well, many say, oh, these crowns of city walls appear on various stamp seals that have been found. Um, when you look very closely at these seals, this is just another example of queenly headdress. It doesn't really look like a crown of city walls. It's a cap-like crown because there's a spike that comes out of the top or maybe some kind of a cone. So this might be a closer match to what we have here on the seal from Nimrud, but there's only ever one spike, and here we seem to have multiple. Ha! Huh, the closest match we have seems to be a queen's crown from a middle Assyrian seal. You see the seated figure thought to be a queen, not a goddess, because of the towel the attendant is bringing to her as she's holding the mirror. So these, I will show you two drawings of it, these multiple spikes on the crown seem to be the closest match, so suggesting that this is a queen depicted. However, Remember, Dr. Wurr suggested it was a goddess. What was she thinking of? What did she have in mind? A very close match that I found, but I, I can't confirm this is her basis for the interpretation. There is a Neo-Assyrian seal showing a goddess. We know it's a goddess because her leg is shown here bare with one of these boxy spiky crowns and a really ornamental band going down her back. So on this basis of the um, deity being shown wearing this kind of crown. Perhaps Dr. Wurr interpreted this figure as a deity herself. Maybe it, it could be a deity. So the, the last figure that we still have kind of unidentified is the figure following the king whose headdress we're a little still unsure of. There are seals showing eunuchs, and I point to two here. We know they're eunuchs because the seal is inscribed saying they're eunuchs that have just a headband, but not a ribbon going down the back. So this figure may have no headband or a headband and something going down the back, making it more likely that it is the crown prince. So this is the puzzle. This is the question. These are the interpretations. I won't go over all of the possibilities one by one, but you see there are four main possible configurations. In some of them, we have the figure being identified as a queen, in some identified as a goddess. The next steps would be looking for other examples of iconography in which you have this sacred tree with the winged uh, disc above it. Do you ever have examples of a goddess on one side, royal figures on the other, or is it always two royal figures flanking these divine emblems in the center? That might be a, a route to an, uh, um, a more firm interpretation. Well, with that, I want to thank you for puzzling through and pondering this seal with me. Um, and I hope we can imagine perhaps that we were puzzling through it um, with Dr. Wurr as it is through the foundation that she laid for us through her drawing, through her publication of this material that we've been able to even start to ask these questions. I think that she would have enjoyed um, the work that I hope we can all carry forth um, inspired by her. In this image, you see her peering at some of the seals that she curated at the Iraq Museum. Um, and I want to just um, thank you all again for kind of joining and participating and even thinking about these seals from Iraq in her honor. And um, thank you for joining us in thinking about the future and the past, the very deep past of Iraq that will carry on into the very deep future, I hope. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, that actually brings us up right to the end, so that was fantastic timing. Uh, <laughs> thank you for that. Um, I want to thank everyone who attended today, as well as the panelists on behalf of Tari and myself. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or to, to Tari, and we can either connect you with one of the panelists or um, address the questions ourselves. Thank you again for joining us and have a lovely rest of your day.
Bye.